out. That's why they made voodoo something negative. Yeah. Because what we started doing, we started getting... Hold on. What? Oh, damn. Shit. Y'all. 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 What the fuck? Okay. Hold on. Wait, I'm not ready yet. Can y'all hold on for a second? I just hurt my dang on leg. Y'all can't even see it. I'm gonna get ready. Give me a second. See, because y'all wanted to start the video without me, and I wasn't even ready, I wasn't even sitting down, there's a hole in a perfectly good furniture. Let's, let's just get into the rest of the video. The word zombie, which the zombie genre is real big today, that comes from a, a Haitian man named John Zombie, mm. who was killing white people yeah in um haiti during the revolution mm. after the revolution was over and they were getting the french out it was this light-skinned slave former slave named john zombie who was slaughtering the french so his name became synonymous with terror mm. that's where the word zombie comes from let's just get straight into the video ancestors getting their get back let's see y'all finna go through my vault of likes on tiktok before i start y'all go follow her because i really love her storytelling she be telling it all and with no filter Y'all ever hear the story of the little slave girl that was bought as a concubine and was tired of her master essaying her so she killed his ass? Get your popcorn. This story takes place in Callaway County, Missouri in 1855. Missouri? A man by the name of Robert Newsom bought a slave by the name of Celia. Robert purchased Celia a year after his wife passed away to do the cooking and cleaning of his plantation. But that's not the only reason why he bought Celia. He owned five other slaves, which were all men, but he wanted little Celia to be his concubine. So this middle-aged man made the journey to go find a woman slave and brought her back. As soon as he reached home, I mean, the carriage wasn't even unpacked yet, he essayed her. And this began a long five and a half year journey of him essaying Celia. She did cook and clean his plantation, his house, and served his grown children, but she was seen as a sexual object to Robert. Like I said, he lived with his adult children. Her cabin was only 50 feet from the home, so everybody knew, as quiet as kept, what he was sneaking out every single night and doing to Celia. They all act like it wasn't happening, but it absolutely was. Two years after she arrived at the plantation, she became pregnant and gave birth to a mulatto child that belonged to Robert. Then two years after that, she was forced to give birth to another one of his kids. But what nobody expected is after her second child, she actually fell in love with one of Robert's other slaves named George. And by all accounts, they had a consensual relationship. They were in love. But even though she was in a relationship with George, she still was being essayed by Robert. After five years of all of this, George and Celia had enough. So George gave her an ultimatum. Either you tell him to stop this shit or we're done. I can't, I can't do this no more. Fearing losing George, she went to Robert and told him, I'm not doing this no more, which was actually really brave for that time. But Robert was like, yeah, whatever. I'll see you in your cabin tonight. And at that moment, he fucked around and he was about to find out. And I forgot to mention, at this point, she was pregnant with her third child. And she didn't know if it was George's or if it was Robert's. So after she already had asked nicely, she went out to the woods, picked up the biggest branch stick that she could muster. Because remember, she's pregnant. Yes. And put it in the corner of her cabin. I know that's right. And waited. It must be added that she had... Very, very bad morning sickness and had already begged Robert to leave her the fuck alone. It's not like this was just like the first time she had asked him to stop. Mm. She had asked him several times to lay off her. So that night, Robert wobbled his 60-year-old ass into her cabin like he did every night. And Celia grabbed the stick that she had collected earlier in the day to ward him off and told him, like, don't come no closer. All right? And this heartless old bastard was doing this in front of her kids. Like, they lived in a little cabin, so he was SAing her in front of her kids. When he didn't back up, she whacked his ass over the head. That's what and I'm talking sure about. He ain't get back up. She continuously bludgeoned him. And she said, and I quote, the devil got into me. 
That wasn't the devil. That was the ancestors getting their reparation. Right. She beat his colon. Once she knew he was good and dead, she rolled his ass into the fire and tended to it all night. She barbecued his ass to ash and bones. Yeah, bro. I check. <laughs> the larger bones that were not disintegrated by the fire, she crushed them. And then she put them in the floorboards, like pushed them through the floorboards of her cabin. So after a long sleepless okay, night of you. doing the good Lord's work, she went to sleep. She got up right before noon and started spying on the family because, of course, they're looking for Robert. Mm -hmm. But then she noticed that the ash in her fireplace was far too much. It would have looked suspicious. It looked weird. So she commissioned Robert's 12-year-old grandson, Coffee, who also lived on the plantation with them, to dispose of his grandfather unknowingly. Sis was low-key a savage. For real. So she told Coffee, I'll give you two dozen walnuts if you clean out my fireplace and get rid of the ashes. And he was super excited because apparently he loved walnuts. So he gathered his grandfather's ashes and scattered them down the pathway all the way to a stable that was on the property. So after Robert was missing for 12 hours, his grown kids was like, we're going to go talk to Celia. The same person that they didn't even think anything was going on between them two. Why would you go to our cabin first if you knew that nothing was going on? Mm -hmm. After basically interviewing her for hours, she finally caved in and told them what she had done. She was arrested, but what makes this case very, very interesting is that they didn't immediately hang her. Back then, even in this old time in the state of Missouri, a woman had a right, a God-given right, to kill a man that essayed her. Mm. But because she was an enslaved woman, that didn't apply to her. But her defense did go back and forth for months over this, giving out all of the counties and state laws to try to get Cecilia off. Yes. During this time, somewhere between October and December, she had given birth and it was a stillborn. She was so stressed out during this whole trial period that she lost her baby. The judge acknowledged that this was a law and that technically she should be protected under it. But because she was one fourth a human, he wouldn't hear of it. So on December 21st, 1855, 19-year-old Celia was walked to the gallows and hung. Her two biracial daughters were sold to Harry Newsom, which was Robert Newsom's son. So he basically bought his sisters. This story had no real spiritual reparations because there's not much else on the internet about her. But she got her reparations up front. She did. And I'm pretty sure she'd do it again. Right. Do good and be good. That was a crazy story. I'm telling you, I like her. We're going to watch another one of her videos. Have you ever heard the story about the little slave girl that poisoned her old master's family and then haunted the place for all of eternity? Get your popcorn. On today's edition of Fuck Around and Find Out, the spiritual reparations version, we have the haunting of Myrtle's Plantation. It's in St. Francisville, Louisiana. Today it is a beautiful bed and breakfast, as all plantations turn into spirit. The story start off with newlyweds purchasing this plantation and they were Mr. and Mrs. Woodruff. Mr. Woodruff was a judge, but he took a particular liking and hating to one of his slaves named Chloe. He would physically, verbally, and mentally abuse this girl. She had to be anywhere between 13 and 16 years old. Of course, he essayed her frequently and was just this. a nasty colonizer. He was terrible to Chloe, and Chloe wanted to do something to try to get into his good graces. She was tired. So she decided that one day that she was going to eavesdrop on one of his conversations to try to get some tea on how to make him calm down, like trying to help herself, basically. But Mr. Woodruff caught her eavesdropping. Instead of sending her away like a normal person would do, he had to make an example out of her. So this grown man cut off both her ears. She was so ashamed. She was embarrassed, humiliated, so she took to wearing a green turban to cover her missing ears and the scars. Bro, Bro what? The boy was pissed. And she was not going to let him play her like that. Now, the next <laughs> part of this story is what I like to call Swamp Talk. Give me the reference. Because this pot of key, this story, changes depending on who you're talking to. 
Some say it was an accident. Others say it was on purpose. I'm more inclined to believe that she did this on purpose. And no, I do not support the unaliving of children or anyone, but this is, this is what she came to. On Mr. Woodruff's daughter's ninth birthday, Chloe put Orlander, and sorry if I'm saying it wrong, correct me y'all, Orlander leaves in the cake. Now around the bayou, some say that she was only trying to poison Mrs. Woodruff and the children so that she can nurse them back to health and be back in Mr. Woodruff's good graces. Others say that she wanted him to experience a loss as significant as she did, if not worse. Either way, the dose was lethal. It ended up killing Mrs. Rudrow and two of her kids. Serve Y'all heard the right. saying, all kinfolk ain't skinfolk. Serve you right. So news of this spread among slaves and got back to Mr. Woodruff. So he hung Chloe. And it's been on and cracking ever since then. Okay. Some say she cursed this house before he hung her. She- but spiritual reparations definitely commenced after he hung her. After he hung her, he put some bricks on her body and threw her in the Mississippi River. Everyone that purchased this plantation after the Woodruffs suffered or died or something. Uh, what, what you're not finna do is think that, oh, just because our physical bodies die, that we're not going to become stronger in the spirit realm. There's no limitations. Do you not get that? There's no limitations when you've lit, left this vessel. Everything is more lighter. You can do more things. You can create more things. People so scared of death and then all of the stuff that happened to our ancestors of them jumping ship and them being, you know, killed in a horrible way. And you think everything's just just, just done? It's done and over with after you left the body? After you left this 3D realm? No. No. This is a prime example of that. Let's get to the next story. Now, this next story is about Delphine LaLaurie. I'm not calling her madam because she ain't no madam to me. The story goes about how she is labeled as a serial killer, really. Now, this story is talking about how the ancestors got her get got, got that get back. Crimes that she committed was so bad, they even put it into a TV show. If y'all watched it, it's called American Horror Story, which is what you see in that lady right there. Y'all ever hear of the disgusting slave owner that got all of her slaves repoed? Actually, you guys have, because I've covered her. But I have more tea. Y'all remember the story of Marie yes. Delphine Lalari in the Lalari Mansion? If you're new here, then go ahead and find that video. It should be on my playlist of haunted plantations. I'm gonna give you a quick synopsis. In my original video, I took you guys down a journey of a slave owner in New Orleans who was so terrible to her slaves that the community rallied up against her and repoed her slaves. Then she bought them back. She had one of her family members go down there and get her slaves back. But some of my followers gave me some tea. And when I say tea, baby, I mean tea. So at the end of my original story, the La Lottery Mansion went up in flames and it was set on fire by a 70 year old slave who was trying to commit suicide. She ran off into the sunset and went to France and lived a quiet life, or so they wanted us to believe. A lot of you guys have heard about this story on American. You know, when she was about to get arrested before the stuff that she was doing to her slaves, which was downright not even, they couldn't even say it was legal. After all the things that they have done in human history in America, they did the, the stuff that she was doing was not legal they could not let her go with this so they were trying to catch her set her mansion on fire they were trying to find her and word on the street is that she went back to france and she escaped capture but she got some tea about that horror story coven and the ending of that episode what happened to marie was a stark difference from what historians say happened. Why are they doing this to us? Because we can. <sighs> so my followers who are from the area, born and raised, and got the pot of key from their ancestors, mm. put me up on game. Okay. So not only was she horrible to her slaves, she was also a cannibal. She was eating them. She was also doing medical experimentation on these people. She was making human centipedes out of enslaved people. This serial killer was unhinged. Because anytime you piss off your own people who are doing slightly similar things to you, that means you've gone too far, mama. But it's also said that she was practicing voodoo. Her and her husband, Louis. They actually blame Louis more than they blame her. And while he was doing this medical 
experiment, one of his slaves were starting to, they were doing ritualistic medical practices. And one of the spirits came to him in the fire that he had, and he turned his back and ignored the help of the Lua. So it is said that she made it out of New Orleans before the mob came into her house to arrest her or do whatever they was going to do. Mm. But here's T. She never made it out of New Orleans. Mm, 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 mm. See, what most people don't know back then, New Orleans was a hub for free black folk. Mm. And with the help of this free queen, the queen of voodoo herself, Marie Madame Laveau, oh girl, never had a chance to make it out of New Orleans. Because it is said that this voodoo queen, along with a couple other priestess, got to that ass. It just makes my little black soul smile. Wait. That she got the ending that she deserved. Wait a minute. Alright, boo boo. Wait a minute. 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 In the TV show, in the American Horror Story, Marie Laveau definitely got her revenge on um, Delphine. But what she's saying is that this actually happened from sources that she know who lives in Louisiana. I mean, New Orleans, yeah. So, I'm gonna read these comments. Hold on, hold, hold on. Let me read these comments real quick. I had looked up, where is this woman buried, right? It says, St. Louis Cemetery, New Orleans, Louisiana, right? But guess who else is buried in the same cemetery? Marie Laveau is buried in the same cemetery. St. Louis Cemetery, Delphine and Marie Laveau. Y'all can't tell me. Y'all cannot tell me that that woman, they were living in New Orleans at the same time in the same city. You don't think they crossed paths? You don't think something happened? Ain't nobody... Nah, nah. I, I believe her. I believe her. But yeah, I appreciate y'all for staying with me through the story time. Hopefully we can do more of these. And y'all stay dangerous, okay? And make sure y'all go follow the storyteller because she is really good at it.